More than 4 billion people live across this vast continent called Asia, and we are telling their stories. On this edition, Indonesia's massive garbage problem. This staggering mountain of trash will only get bigger, smellier, and more unmanageable. And Syrian children who witnessed the destruction of war. They're now trying to adapt to a new life and trying out new skills in neighboring Turkey. I'm Silkina Alawalia, and this is Assignment Asia. Welcome to the program. According to the Indonesian authorities, its capital Jakarta produces 7,000 tons of garbage every day. The largest volume of waste collected is transported to the Bantar Gabang final dumping site in Bekasi, located east of the capital city. So enormous is this dumping site that it's been called the mountain, where the smell is so intense that it affects people as far as 10 kilometers away. Some people living in its vicinity have even been paid what's known as smelly money to put up with a stench. But the giant dump has turned out, as I discovered, to be a source of income and livelihood for over 15,000 families. Just an hour's drive out of Jakarta lies a mountain. 110 hectares of Jakarta's trash located in the town of Bantar Gabang in West Java, stretching as far and high as the eye can see. Among these mountains, there are thousands of families who have built their homes and livelihood. One of them is Sole Salahuddin. Sole has been living among these trash in Bantar Gabang for 12 years. His daily job is living off the landfill, rummaging through these piles of rotting vegetables, plastic, broken phones and glass, hoping to find something valuable. He has been scavenging around Jakarta since 1989, when he was just 10 years old. Soleh remembers his school days, when he began to take up scavenging. He never went on to finish school. Without an education, he made very little money before his cousins introduced him to this job. Soleh mostly collects plastic waste, which he then sells to recycling facilities across the city. Some plastic items can be sold for nearly two U.S. dollars. And yet it's a job he does not want to leave. He worked as a gardener for a short time a few years ago, but then realized he made much less money than he would as a scavenger. But the higher pay also means longer hours and greater risks. Soleh is just one out of thousands of men and women who treat these mountains of garbage as their means of income. Scavengers here start their workday late in the evening and finish in the early hours of the morning. Soleh's elder daughter Sophie was born among the landfill. Her school, her friends and her entire life were built around this area. Oh, 
A shy 15-year-old, Sophie spends most of her free time at this non-profit school called BGBJ, which translates to the seeds of Bantar Gabang. Its owner, Ressa Bunard, shares the same fate as many of the children around here. Born in West Sumatra, Ressa's parents moved to Bantar Gabang when she was six years old. After she graduated from high school, she went back to her hometown of West Sumatra to become a doctor. That dream didn't come true, but she still wanted to make an impact, and now she's doing it in a different way. What did this area look like when you were growing up? Was it also a landfill? No, it was a beautiful place. It was a rice field. And then I still remember when I was a kid with, with my friend, in the morning, on Sunday morning, my friend will come to my home and then call me, Ray, Reza, let's, uh, let's join us to the rice field. And then we, we went to the rice field and then tried to catch the small fish. And then uh, like pretending like a farmer in the, in the rice field. But after uh, I think less than a year or just six months or something, after we moved into this area and then people dig, start digging the land and then we questioning what people gonna do in this place. And then we know that people gonna expand the landfill. <laughs> After her return from West Sumatra, Ressa saw many of the children in Bantar Gabang were in desperate need of motivation and encouragement. That led her to start BGBJ in 2004. When I was a kid, actually, I, I already got the feeling that living in the landfill is not something normal and then it was difficult. And also, like, uh, people, like, Many people underestimate you because you are from uh, the landfill uh, place. And then that's what I experienced. I have to, to get uh, like proper education. And then that's, that's the reason why my, my mom sent me to West Sumatra. So like, she think that I can be something in the future. That inspiration helped Ressa to push and motivate the children here through education. She knew she wanted to be different, a light in the dark to the children in need of hope. BGBJ provides education, assistance, food, and also recreational activities for the children who lack access to these resources. With these classes, the organization aims to provide alternatives for young people by giving them the right tools and knowledge to break out of their poverty cycle. Every Sunday, the children of Bantar Gabang attends classes where volunteers teach English, sports, music, arts, and other enriching topics. Their volunteers come from around the world, from United Kingdom to China. For years, Ressa has been working to get the government support for many of the families here. One of the projects she's working on is to have the government and local community build a daycare center to support the parents who are scavengers in this area. Ressa says many of the parents bring their children with them to the landfill, exposing them to unsanitary and unhealthy conditions. It can also plant the idea in these children that they don't need to dream big or to obtain a proper job to make a living, and that being a scavenger is enough. That is the mindset Ressa aims to change through her organization. And then that's what I'm telling the kids, you're not poor kids, no way. And then uh, that's, that's what uh, we keep telling the children. If people come to BGBG, don't, uh, don't beg, don't ask food, money, from uh, people who come because we are not poor at all and then we are rich and then we have to have our uh, uh, the character when people come to our place they will say like oh the kids will behave and then they're not like a beggar. Ressa also wants to work on improving and monitoring waste management issues as she felt that local governments are still unaware of the seriousness of the issue. The problem is, Indonesia does not have proper waste management programs. I spoke to many of the children that live around this area, and although they sort out and recycle their trash in school because they're being taught that, they don't really do it at home. So the aim is to create an awareness and to make them understand that waste management facilities are important and that this mountain of trash is not normal. Jakarta is home to 10 million people. Each day, its people produce more than 7,000 square meters of garbage, and that figure continues to increase each day. 
Due to the city's lack of waste management education, Jakarta does not have its own garbage processing facility. For decades, Jakarta's trash has been dumped here in Bantar Gabang. When this landfill was constructed, its capacity was set to just around 5,000 tons. Today, new trucks arrive every day, with more than 8,000 tons of rubbish being dumped here. It's more than overflowing, and the mayor of Bekasi says it's at risk for closure. Sampah DKI ke Bandar Gebang itu sekitar tahun 86, 85, 86, 87 lah, mulai operasional, kurang lebih sekitar itu lah. Bahkan mungkin sekitar 8, 85. Jadi kalau dihitung akumulasinya sekarang ini, ya depositnya sampah itu itu udah jutaan kubik dengan luas sekitar 120 ribu, eh, 120 hektar, ya. Jadi kalau dibuat lapangan golap itu udah udah 36 hall itu lapangan golap di sana. Jadi memang depositnya sudah sedemikian rupa dan sistem pengolahannya pun juga masih sistem sanitary landfill. Rahmat says now it's all too late. The government needs to educate people to stop recycling and start reducing. He believes the recycling system is flawed because it doesn't allow consumers to understand the root of the issue. Recycling indirectly shows that producing trash is not a big deal as long as it can eventually be processed in recycling facilities. But that involves even more manpower and equipment that cost a huge amount of money. The problem today is how to rid Bantar Gabang of the existing garbage. Local governments and communities in Bekasi and Jakarta are working to start getting rid of the waste that has already mounted. Jakarta is working on building four recycling facilities in the city. But Rahmat says while waiting for those facilities to be completed in more than two years, the government still needs to do something with the existing waste. Sri Bebasari is often called the Queen of Trash. A self-proclaimed name, Sri was part of the team that helped to create Indonesia's waste management law. Its emergence was due to the landslide that happened in Bantar Gabang back in 2000, claiming several lives. After that incident, parties, including the House of Representatives, decided to conduct a thorough research on waste management. At the time, Sri tirelessly worked for years to have the law approved by the Ministry of Environment. Finally, in 2008, Indonesia officially introduced the waste treatment law for the first time in history. Some of the key measures spelt out in the law include the implementation of waste reduction activities and regulating different types of waste, from household to the corporate level. Years of research has taught Sri that waste management is highly complex and multi-dimensional. Jadi tidak ada teknologi yang paling bagus, yang ada paling cocok sesuai penyakitnya kan. Jadi tidak boleh kita mengatakan teknologi insinerator itu lebih bagus dari kompos, kompos lebih bagus. Kita butuh semua gitu. The challenging nature of waste management has turned technology into a vital and even indispensable component in Indonesia's fight against waste. Sebenarnya yang mengurus sampah itu siapa sih regulatornya? Siapa operatornya? Terus kalau misalnya di negara, berapa kementerian gitu. Nah sekarang kan misalnya Menteri PU, Menteri LH, Dep Dagri, padahal juga harusnya ada Menteri Agama, Menteri Pendidikan, dan lain-lain. Karena ini pembangunan manusia, bukan hanya pembangunan fisik. Misalnya, misalnya contoh misalnya sampah di sungai. Kalau Menteri PU itu mungkin bikin alat atau bendungan gitu. Tapi yang siapa yang bisa mengajarkan orang tidak buang ke sungai? Nah, makanya Menteri Agama perlu di sini, karena mungkin aja ulama, gereja, dan lain-lain. Ini pembangunan manusia, dan pembangunan manusia itu lebih kompleks. Today, Sri spends most of her days at the Rawasari Integrated Waste Processing Site in central Jakarta. It's owned by the city's government, which was established since the year 2000. She's working to introduce composting techniques to create a neat, ideal, and even odorless garbage processing facility. For now, life will remain the same for the families and children in Bantar Gabang. I hope the children in BGBG, BG, they, uh, they can see there is a hope for the future. I want to achieve this and ha I have to do this. And then uh, that's what we are doing in BGBG, BG, like we keep motivating them. I said to the children, use BGBG BG as a place 
for you to be creative and then to, to, to tell the world that we are exist and then we are human, we are part of Indonesia, and then we are not miserable people, we are happy people. But what we need is just uh, give us opportunity. Bandar Gebang has shown that one man's trash is another man's treasure. Soleh does not have any plans of leaving his job of being a scavenger. He continues to push his children to become the future leaders of tomorrow, pinning all of his hopes and dreams on them. Aku pengen orang-orang di sini jangan buang sampah sembarangan, jaga kebersihan, terus jangan pakai sampah plastik supaya bumi kita indah dan indah dipandang dan sehat juga. In the midst of this growing mountain of trash, families go about their day-to-day -day activities showing the incredible strength of the human spirit. And an example that even though conditions may be challenging, love, joy, and most importantly, hope, will always thrive even in the most unlikely of places. Among the 7,000 tons of rubbish that Jakarta generates, almost a third of them are plastic. Exposed to sunlight and scorched by waves and tides, the plastics degenerate into tiny particles, or microplastics, which are ingested by marine life. This has not only affected water quality, it has also damaged coral ecosystem and threatened human health. This has prompted the Indonesian government to pledge a billion dollars a year in order to reduce by 2025 the amount of plastic in its waters by 70%. Next on Assignment Asia, helping these Syrian children to secure a brighter future. Since the start of the Syrian war in 2011, over 6.2 million have been displaced, including 2.6 million children, or about 42 percent. Described as a lost generation, many of these children are dispersed in refugee camps in neighboring countries, such as Jordan, Lebanon, and Turkey. In the case of Turkey, it is home to over 1.2 million child refugees, making it the top child refugee hosting country in the world. And as Natalie Carney found out, a school in southern Turkey, north of the Syrian border, has tried to instill not just hope, but also confidence in some of these children. Mesopotamia, a land broadly defined between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. A land where the world's earliest civilization developed and where a new society is being cultivated, a society of circus performers. Yet this circus is like none other. أنا اسمي خالد قاسم عمري 15 سنة أنا من الشام من سوريا وأنا لما عم أرقص بالعرض أو بالتدريب أو أنا عم أعلم أو أنا عم أتعلم وبطنش الكل حولي بس بفكر بحالي أنا اسمي حالة حاج محمود من سوريا من حلب عمري 14 سنة جينا من حلب للدرباسية جينا من هناك هربنا مع أهلي أمي وأخواتي يعني العساكر ما شافونا كانوا معنا غير جابونا لأنه الطفل السوري شاف معاناة لما نجي لهون إجا لتركيا لهون وشاف معاناة كبيرة تعذب وفي ناس واجهت حرب وفي ناس واجهت مشاكل كتير عندنا صارت نفسيتهم تعبانة كتير صار بدهم شي شغلة تغير هالنفسية تعطيهم أمل بالحياة تعطيهم أمل بالمستقبل فصرنا نجمعهم بهالسيرك هذا and this building provides a safe haven where these children can open up and discover unexplored talents and confidence. Along Turkey's southeast border with Syria is the city of Mardin, known for its rich cultural history. Mardin is often referred to as an open-air museum with its historic architecture and breathtaking views of the Mesopotamian plains. But its diverse culture is what stands out to many historians. This city is a rich blend of Turkish, Kurdish, Arab and Assyrian ethnicities, all languages which can still be heard on the streets today. 
It is for this reason Pinar Demoral, with her professional circus background and her partner, started the Circani, or Circus School, here in 2014. It runs under the Herier de Sanat, or Everywhere Art Organization, which has been helping refugee children deal with the traumas of their past through the arts. Every month we have up to 100 children coming to regularly to the, this school. So as we have three centers in three different parts of the city, and they learn how to walk on stilts, they learn how to climb, they can make juggling, they can make acrobatics dance, which make them much stronger and much interesting than the other people. Wars and displacement in neighboring countries have forced millions to leave their homes. Most have trickled over the border into Turkey. In that time, there were lots of Syrian children coming to area, and they had difficulties to integrate in the schools or having difficulties with the language and many, with many things. So the circus was the key thing. They don't need to speak to each other, they don't need to speak the language, but they still can express themselves with what they are doing. They start to grow inner person, mentality, emotions, they also get stronger. The things that they say, I couldn't do this, after a few practice, they say, oh, I can't do this. Halla hated Turkey when she arrived with her family from Syria in 2013. She felt like a stranger until she joined the circus three years ago. One of Hala's closest friends is Khalid. He's been with the circus for three and a half years. Khalid met Iyad Haj Mahmoud at Sirkani, a partnership they might have struggled to find as refugee children. Khalid and Iyad never knew each other before coming to the school, and now they're absolutely inseparable. In fact, their dancing skills have become quite recognized amongst the community, and they hope it's this that will lift them out of their refugee status. Since meeting, these two have been performing together all across Turkey and have created quite a sensation. As a refugee person, you have double disadvantage on this because you don't know the language, you are considered in the society as nothing, you're not important. When they go in the public, they just show their skills, not their personality, background, their nation, doesn't matter. All the public, they just see them as heroes. They, they become like, whoa, how they can do this? But working with children who have witnessed war and suffered trauma is not always easy. Therefore, social workers and other professionals are also available to help the kids burdened by their experiences. There are some like uh, further traumatic children and some, some just like light traumas. And light traumas, it's easy to get rid of and start to play. But there are some children, they take maybe months or years. Many of these kids also take part in the supplementary schooling courses offered here, such as computers and Turkish. Some even go on to become trainers and mentors in the circus themselves, such as Khaled, who takes the role very seriously. These trained students can then go on to teach the Sirkani project to others across the region. Today, 18 students from the Sirkani program in Marden are practicing for a very important performance. The United Nations High Commission for Refugees has asked them to perform at a camp in the southern Turkish province of Antakya for World Refugee Day. This will be the first time many of these kids have left Marden since arriving. Today, the stage is being set at the Altano Zoo refugee camp, where Syria and the reminders of a former life are only a stone's throw away. Set up in 2016, these containers are now home to more than 8,500 of Turkey's 3 million refugee population. When the children finally arrive from Mardin, some 550 kilometers away, they are exhausted but excited. Excited the whole way in the bus and screaming, dancing. 
They gather in the camp school to change and put in one last rehearsal. They hustle to the stage, nerves and all, where an eager audience awaits. Then, it's showtime. Bravo! In its own unique way, each act aims to teach the children in the audience not to hurt or bully one another. The performance is a success. The audience loved it, and so did the performers. Uh, they, they grow, they grow as a person, they grow as a group, they grow as a skills, they become more respected, more respectful, more friendly, more team by all each process. The group revels in their newfound fame and confidence, but then it's time to pack up and take the long journey back to Martin. There's a regional circus festival in two months' time to prepare for. Another sunset over the plains of Mesopotamia. And it's back to what these kids love most on the rooftop of the Sirkani house. Uh, this experience uh, literally changed my life because you can build up your own life even even if you're a refugee, even if you are you have no educational background, then you create magics in your life. And overcoming the experiences that destabilized them is key. Returning to Syria is in the back of the minds of many of these children. So if a time comes that will allow for that, they would return as educated, talented and confident members of society, armed with the strength to restore their country's former glory. For Assignment Asia, I'm Natalie Carney in Mardin, Southeast Turkey. According to aid organizations, there are over 700,000 school-age Syrian children in Turkey. But more than half don't have the chance to attend school. One main barrier is language, as Turkish schools don't have Arabic curriculum, leaving the children with gaps in their education. Some children even find themselves conscripted into the workforce, ending up as child labor. Even though such a form of labor is forbidden in Turkey, many still end up in the textile or agricultural industries, or as harvest workers in the fields. That's all the time we have for this week. I'm Sulkina Walia. Thanks for watching, and join us again on Assignment Asia. Share your thoughts and contribute story ideas for future shows by contacting us on social media.